ليس اليتيم الذي قد مات والده إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والأدب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم everyone welcome to another episode of Islamic Weekly Society program called Influential Muslim Alhamdulillah today we have with us Dr. Badran uh, who I will be introducing in a, in a minute but uh, some of you may have been introduced to the society previously in our previous program but just to give you um, some sort of background as to what the society is and its activities that uh, is engaging uh, currently the society was founded in 2019 with a a basic aim to educate the Muslim, to reintroduce the Muslim to the glory of Islamic literature and to reawaken, if you can use that term, to reawaken the soul of the Muslim and kind of reconnect and rejuvenate our desire to recapture our narrative that is so uh, badly narrated by others other than the Muslim. So the society intends to do all this by uh, reading, by, you know, connecting to, to our scholars, past and present, um, so, that, so that the Muslim can, in, in contemporary world, uh, have some confidence in his culture and his civilization. With regards to Dr. Badran, mashallah, I mean, when I looked at his CV, Allah barik fi, it's very impressive, and, and most of you probably are aware of his activity, but I'll, I'll just give a short, short uh, you know, introduction to, for, for those who are not Dr. Badran holds a PhD in philosophy and Islamic civilization study from the University of Putra, Malaysia, and an MA in comparative religion and Islamic thought from the International Islamic University, again in Malaysia. He is currently a research, research assistant professor at Ibn Khaldun Center for Humanity and Social Science, Qatar University. I welcome you to the show, uh, Ustad Badran, and, and thank you for your time and your, 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 your presentation, and I'll let you take over. Barakallahu Thank you very much, dear brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. And marhaban li jami' on the audience, uh, whether they are from the Arab world or from there, from your country in UK. Uh, uh, actually, it's good uh, to post a reading through this uh, Islamic literary society, which is uh, very important to educate our uh, modern generation and educate them about Islamic thought, Islamic uh, uh, pioneers of thought in different uh, parts of the Muslim world, at least uh, they will be aware about uh, different schools of thought, different approaches to our uh, situation and modern uh, problems that we are facing in our endeavor to uh, to promote the kind of Islamic uh, renaissance within the frame of Islam and uh, modern uh, time. Uh, today, inshallah, I, I will talk about uh, Malik ibn Abi. I am sure most of, uh, of you know much better about Malik ibn Abi than me. However, I, I try to introduce uh, the personality and uh, the main um, facts of his life, his writings, and the major um, ideas or great ideas of Malik bin Nabi in order to uh, open the floor for uh, discussion and more elaboration. Okay, in this regard, uh, I will talk in this, in this session about putting Malik bin Nabi in, in the context of modern thought and talk about some facts of, from his life, his writings, and as I said, uh, his main or great uh, ideas. But before we start, uh, I would like to show some, some, some pictures, some photos of Malik bin Nabi from different stages of his life, from his younghood until he became older, here in this picture with uh, Minister Mulut Qasim Ali Rahmatullah and other places here in Cairo. Here it is uh, about uh, youth camp, uh, at different, different stages of his life. Uh, let's go further to put Malik bin Nabi in the 
our contextualized Malik ibn Nabi as, as thinker, as pioneer of thought, as mujaddid in this modern time. Uh, Malik ibn Nabi was a renowned uh, 20th century Algerian uh, a scholar. He was considered by many uh, thinkers and, and intellectuals uh, as a notable Muslim thinker since Ibn Khaldun. Malik ibn Nabi left so many uh, contributions, especially in the field of civilization and civilizational thought. Um, he uh, developed his own approach, uh, looking for universal laws and fundamental principles that govern the dynamics of human society in general, uh, and Muslim societies in particular. Actually, Ibn Abi had left behind great intellectual legacy uh, that has certainly shaped uh, our modern and contemporary outlook towards understanding uh, of human civilization. Although uh, Malik bin Abi's works had been uh, widely accessible in French and Arabic since 1950s, uh, his ideas were hardly received serious attention uh, at least prior to 1980s. Uh, Malik bin Abi, uh, in many uh, instances, was mis understood, misinterpreted by uh, some uh, conflicting ideological quarters, whether in the Muslim world, in Algeria or outside. However, as I said, uh, so many intellectuals consider him as a great writer, a thinker, and probably uh, among the most prominent social philosophers the Muslim world has uh, ever produced since the time uh, of Ibn Khaldun. Uh, Anwar Ibrahim, for example, consider Malik bin Nabi as philosopher, visionary for the entire Ummah, not only for Algeria or for the third world, uh, who was so concerned about the decadence of the Muslim civilization. He was not an academician writing about something very abstract, but he was trying to provide uh, entries and perspective to resolve uh, very crucial uh, problems of uh, today Muslim civilization. Uh, this concern about the Ummah and the stagnation of uh, Muslim civilization led him to undertake an intellectual journey trying to unveil uh, the roots and or the root causes of decadence and uh, backwardness of Muslim civilization. Um, Despite uh, acknowledgments, and he received, uh, but still uh, not well known among intellectuals outside uh, Arabic and French speaking intellectuals. Although uh, matters pertaining to culture, to civilization, cyclical uh, conception of history, uh, social change, had been the center of attention in most of the writings about Malik bin Nabi. Uh, yet we recognize that many more uh, facets of his thought uh, have yet to be uh, systematically studied and uncovered. And so many preliminary ideas that he put forth should be analyzed and uh, developed and go beyond what Malik bin Nabi had said. Uh, to date, at least in the Western language, no many, uh, or not many serious studies have been attempted to uncover and understand the originality of this great thinker and his authenticity uh, about the ideas or his ideas about uh, the situation of Muslim civilization. To know more on, about Malik bin Nabi, I, I, I want to, to, to give some insights uh, about some facts uh, from his life. Uh, Malik bin Nabi was born in the beginning of 20th century in 1905 in the region, a region of Constantine or Qasantina as we say in Arabic. 
east of Algeria while uh, it was under French colonization. Ben Nabi received his uh, traditional education at the, the traditional school or the madrasa. In the same time, he was uh, attending the French educational official uh, school. When he uh, completed, uh, until he completed his secondary studies. During that time, uh, Algeria witnessed the emergence and development of Islah or revo uh, reform movement uh, uh, led by uh, Abdul Hamid ibn Badis, Ali Rahmatullah Bashir Ibrahimi, and their uh, colleagues, uh, and Malik bin Nabi, as an Algerian young at that time, uh, became admirer of uh, Ibn Badis and the ulama or association of Muslim Algerian uh, scholars of that time. After he completed his secondary education, he worked uh, in the village of Aflu, west, southwest of Algeria, uh, in which he did not last too long, and he resigned. Then he tried uh, many times to establish his own uh, business uh, with one of his family members, but those uh, tries were fruitless. Uh, then he decided to uh, go to France uh, to study or to further his uh, high uh, studies at the university to join uh, the School of Oriental uh, Studies. However, as an Al Algerian native, uh, he was not granted uh, admission to that prestigious school. Instead, he, uh, uh, he was directed to go to other places. Then Ben Nabi uh, decided as the only chance to uh, further his uh, high studies is to join uh, the Polytechnic Institute, which is the engineering uh, uh, school. Uh, his enrollment in the Polytechnic actually was very good a chance for him to change his entire career and entire mindset and his academic uh, direction. He benefited so much from that school and helped him to be more precise, critical, and very uh, uh, direct to the point when he started developing his uh, perspective about a Muslim uh, situation. So he found himself gaining new knowledge, which he never knew about, new methods and new thinking based mainly on the precision and empirical sciences, mathematical logic, scientific methodology, and systematic thinking. These uh, all dimensions of modern knowledge uh, have their uh, lasting influence on Malik bin Abi's thinking. Moreover, he began not only to extend his interest in studying sciences, but to read philosophy, sociology, and other uh, fields of humanities, as well as uh, to contemplate in various issues related to his uh, society, which was under the French uh, colonization. Gradually, he, he became uh, concerned about the stagnation of Muslim society in Algeria and in the world at large. He graduated in 1935 as an electric, electrical engineer, engineer from Polytechnic. However, he never practiced uh, engineering, but he actually uh, practiced ideas engineering, not electrical engineering. As he said, uh, I practiced kind of ideas engineering which attracted uh, his concern since his early age dominated these ideas, this concern dominated his uh, thinking and determined his career for his entire life. Thanks to uh, Oriental School, which rejected his admission and directed him to go to Polytechnic where he learned from uh, sciences, engineering, mathematics, and that those modern sciences actually helped him too much to develop his own perspective to uh, approach the, the issues of civilization 
from multi-dimensional uh, perspective. As an Algerian student in Paris during 1930s, Ben Nabi became acquainted also with circles of thinkers and anti-colonial uh, anti uh, activists, such as uh, those coming from Africa, Asia, South America, all of them. There he met so many defendants of uh, freedom, uh, leaders of uh, uh, so many parties from different countries, from China, from India, from Vietnam, from Brazil, Mexico, and from uh, South Africa, from different countries, and especially from the Arab world. Because of his, uh, this intellectual uh, engagement and activist life, he became more aware uh, of the political movements in the colonized uh, countries and he built very strong relationships with intellectuals and politicians of that era and more involved in discussing the problems of colonized Algeria and other Muslim and Afro-Asian uh, countries. And one of his books uh, holds the title of Afro-Asiatism, how Africans and Asians cooperate to develop a new, uh, their countries against uh, colonization. In this period, uh, we can say that Ben Nabi became a reformist or Islahi because of the influence of Jamiyatul Ulama and other circles of thought of that uh, time. So he became aware of the importance of the Ulama movement and its teachings and propagated the ideas of Islah uh, and uh, Maghrib, these two uh, uh, slogans, Islah and Maghrib, were very important for Malik bin Nabi, and uh, he tried to follow any banner that denoted and reflected Islam and the reformist movement. That's why he involved in many associations, organizations coming from North Africa or in France, which were uh, for liberation of uh, Maghrib. Uh, countries. Moreover, he spent more than 30 years in same time. So he combined between intellectual life and activist life. While he was involved in those activities, he was also learning. He spent about 30 years learning philosophy, history, sociology, psychology, and other social sciences to understand the phenomenon of the rise, rise and decline of societies and civilizations. He involved, as we said, uh, in, in political activities of North African students, politicians. He tried to establish, he tried to establish connections with different anti anti colonialism from Africa, uh, from the Arab world, and from Asia. His stay in France helped him too much to uh, be, become uh, fluent, fluent in French and uh, to establish his habit of reading and contemplation and gave Ben Nabi uh, a golden opportunity to deepen um, his knowledge of European thought, especially the social and political uh, issues. Accordingly, uh, he raised his intellectual and political awareness and his interest uh, shifted from engineering to philosophy and social sciences, from electrical engineering to the engineering of civilizing, uh, civilization building. So he became increasingly involved in reformist movement, writing, contributing to the issues of reform. He started writing articles, in newspapers and making links with various uh, intellectual quarters, whether they, they were uh, pan-Islamists, pan-Arabists, or uh, even those uh, secularists, those uh, materialist schools, such as uh, communist parties. And he was uh, used to publish some articles about Algeria in uh, the Marxist journal, French Marxist journal, uh, L'Humanity or the, human, uh, the Humanity. 
I mean, what I want to say, Malik bin Nabi has very rich a life intellectually and uh, uh, in terms of uh, activism. He was activist and in same time intellectual. And this helped him to combine both dimensions to develop his own approach to study the issues of Muslim societies and Muslim civilization. And the product of this rich life is uh, uh, so many writings. And that's why in the next point, uh, I want to talk about Ibn Nabi's writings. He started publishing books uh, as early as 1946, and he did not uh, stop writing until his death. More than that, so many uh, of his writings uh, were published after uh, his death, and some of them are still uh, waiting to be uh, published. So he wrote numerous books, articles, delivered hundreds of speeches and intellectual lectures, providing penetrating insights into the philosophy of history, sociology, social and historical change, cultural, uh, civilizational issues and different uh, uh, issues that uh, engaged prominent thinkers of all ages since early uh, uh, human history until his time. We can say he published uh, almost 24 books, but all of them under one title, Mushkilatul Hadara, or Problems of Civilization, of course, with a specific subtitle for each book. So Ben Nabi published uh, his books in three stages. While he is in France, then he, when he went to Egypt, then the last stage when he returned back to independent Algeria. In France, he published his first and very basic, very important and very insightful book, The Quranic Phenomenon, al Bahira al Qurania, in 1946. Then his other two very important books, Shurut al Nahda, Conditions of Renaissance and which had al alam al islami or the course of Muslim society. And this uh, book, The Course of Muslim Society, was uh, translated into English by the Pakistani scholar Asma uh, Rashid in 1990s. When he moved to Egypt as a as, as refugee uh, to join the Algerian revolution delegate in Cairo, he translated his French written books into Arabic with the help of his uh, disciples, students, and uh, friends. Then in Cairo, uh, he published most of his books, The Idea of Afro-Asiatism, uh, Source Algeria, uh, Problem of Culture, Discourse on the New Construction, uh, The Ideological Conflict in Colonized Countries, The Idea of an Islamic Commonwealth, Contemplations in the Heat of the Battle, and so on. Then when he uh, uh, went back to Algeria oh. after independence, Ibn Nabi uh, was appointed as director of higher education. It's kind of uh, higher education minister of our time. The position which he resigned from within few years, he did not um, last too much in that position because he could not uh, implement his ideas and he found some resistance to his revolutionary and civilizational ideas, especially at that time, uh, the Marxist, uh, Marxists were very strong in the administration. He spent the rest of his life in organizing uh, intellectual lectures in his house, one in Arabic on Saturday and one in, in French in uh, in, in uh, Sundays, Saturdays and Sunday. In Algeria, he published the rest of his uh, books, Algerian Horizons, Memories of Centuries Witness, which are his uh, autobiography, Orientalism and its effect on Muslim thought, Memories of Century Witness, the second volume, Problems of Ideas in the Muslim World. And this one is very important book. Maybe one day we can uh, review it and talk about it, still uh, 
we, we still need to, to understand his, this masterpiece of him. Uh, the Muslim uh, in the realm of economics, when he went to Jeddah and he gave lectures in Jeddah about economics from Islamic perspective, then uh, maybe the last book uh, during his lifetime was uh, the role and message of the Muslim in the last third of the 20th century, Tawrul Muslim wa Risalatu. After uh, he passed away, uh, some of his uh, manuscripts were published by uh, some of his students, such as Grand Teams and Between Maturity and Wilderness, The Birth of Society, and this one, uh, Milad Mujtama, or The Birth of Society, is very early uh, Muslim uh, uh, experience to give definition to what is society sociologically other than uh, mm. Marxist or liberal uh, one. Yes, can you mute, uh, can you mute the mics, please? As I said, if we want to look to, uh, this is uh, Hold on, please. Oh. If we go to this uh, page, World Cut Identities, which shows uh, this very uh, important website that uh, give information about the availability of such book or authors' uh, books in the world, according to this website, uh, Malik bin Nabi's works, including translations, about 324 works in 803 publications and eight languages in different 2,676 libraries. Uh, if we try to look for uh, writings about Malik bin Nabi, the main writing started about uh, between 1984-1986, although Malik bin Nabi started publishing at early, as early as 1946. Uh, the main writings about Malik bin Nabi, alhamdulillah, my box is <laughs> on the top, socio-intellectual foundations of Malik bin Nabi's approach to civilization and other books also available about Malik bin Nabi. Regarding uh, the statistics about his books, for example, his, one of his early books, Vocation de l'Islam, which, which was written in French and translated into Arabic, which is Al-Alam al-Islami, as Asma Rashid translated into English as Islam uh, in History and Society, uh, has 49 editions published between 49 uh, 1945 and 2016. As for the Quranic phenomenon, 27 editions for Mushkilatul Afkar, problem of ideas, about 18 uh, editions. So his books were published so many times, especially his main books, Quranic phenomenon, uh, Islam between history and society, um, problem of ideas, and Chorotu Nahda and so on. The main languages were Arabic, then French, then English, Spanish, Turkish, Malay. These are the main languages translated, where Malik bin Abi's books translated into. If you want to uh, go further and talk about uh, bin Abi's great ideas or main uh, concepts of Malik bin Nabi. If we read Malik bin Nabi's uh, heritage, Malik bin Nabi's writings, we can easily find that Malik bin Nabi is a great thinker of his own uh, perspective, which is civilizational perspective towards Muslim issues. 
in same time, he was kind of system builder. He's, he has his own model of analysis. He developed so many concepts and approaches to various issues related to a civilization, such as the equation of civilization, the religious idea, man or human being as primary factor or device of civilizing process, the importance of culture, uh, colonizability, the three phases of cycle uh, of the cycle of civilizations, such as spiritual, rational, instinctual, the three realms, realms of society, or alamul ashkhas, alamul afkar, wa alamul ashya, the three stages of society, pre-civilized society, post-civilized, and civilized, the three ages of society. عمر الفكرة عمر الشخص وعمر الشيء the concept of social uh, relations network three states of the social relations network and so on what I want to say although Malik bin Nabi did not invent everything but he invented the system of thought he invented the model and the approach although he benefited so much from from different uh, philosophers, scholars, and Muslim heritage and Western thought, but he's, he has uh, his own uh, use of those concepts and put them in totally a new system which cannot be uh, related to any other scholar. For example, uh, regarding the, his perspective about uh, civilizational perspective, how Malik bin Nabi did develop this uh, perspective. As early as the third decade of 20th century, uh, bin Nabi realized that the crisis of Muslim world uh, cannot be diagnosed by means of superficial analysis. That's why he criticized al-Islahiyin wal hadathiyin He was uh, very critical to Muslim reformists in same time to, uh, to modernists, uh, those who consider that a Muslim civilization has his, its own uh, vision and we cannot benefit from modern time, or those modernists who try to blame history and to bring everything from the West, he criticized both, both of them. The point is that Malik bin Nabi, uh, so that there was no methodological analysis of the crisis by both quarters, by both parties. That is, uh, there is no diagnostic or pathological study of the Muslim society. He says that uh, those efforts to modernize, to modernize or to develop or to reform uh, Muslim societies did not develop a systematic approach. They were very partial, very limited. They did not develop systematic uh, approach to the crisis in order to pro provide solutions to the Muslim society. That's why he uh, undertook his uh, critical review uh, uh, of the various trends and ideas in the modern Muslim world not only to understand what was a fault or at fault, but also uh, to develop his own ideas and suggestions for uh, regeneration or rebirth of Muslim society. Then he uh, uh, developed his uh, central theme, which was always uh, the, the study of civilization and the attempt to uh, provide solutions the stagnation of Muslim civilization. For example, if we see his, his, his saying here, we quote from him, uh, uh, he said, Malik Bini said, the problem of every people in its essence is that of its civilization. And it is not possible for any people to comprehend and resolve its problem if it does not elevate its thought and capacities to the level of the great human affairs 
and speculate deeply in order to understand the factors, the deep factors which construct and deconstruct civilizations. So he, come, he came out after criticizing different efforts and approaches to this current situation during his time of Muslim civilization, that those different approaches was very partial. They don't have strong basic of systematic analysis of situation. They could not provide pathological analysis of the situation, did not uncover the, the root uh, causes of our stagnation. Then he tried to develop his own uh, concept, which see, which he saw that, that the political, the economic, the social, the educational crisis, they are real crisis, but they are manifestations. They are manifestations of the real crisis, which is the absence of Muslim civilization. If you want to know what did he mean by civilization? Actually, Malik bin Nabi tried to look to the uh, civilization as phenomenon from different angles because it's very complicated phenomenon. If we see this, this uh, figure, Malik bin Nabi uh, provided almost six definitions of civilization. For him, civilization if we define, for example, uh, civilization from uh, functional perspective is kind of total result of the moral and material conditions. If we focus on structure and uh, social essence of civilization, civilization is man plus soil plus type. If we look into socio-intellectual dimensions, we have to look at the culture. If we look to its moral dimension, it's kind of balance between moral and material aspects of life. From psychological and mental uh, perspective, it's kind of psychological and mental force to uh, enable or, or kind of self character and self potentiality that enable uh, members of society to start civilizing process. In its essence, Civilization is a result of living dynamic uh, idea. If we go to more details, for example, this uh, slide give us clear picture about what he mean by his uh, different uh, definitions of civilization. Civilization can be defined as being the sum total of moral as well as uh, material conditions which allow uh, a given society to provide each one of its members with all the so social guarantees necessary for his or uh, their development. So he focuses on both sides, not only material uh, conditions, but also the moral uh, condition, conditions or the spiritual one. Also, uh, civilization is kind, is kind of self force that refines the primitive features within the individual and society, societal context. So once society enters civilizing process, everything will change, will not remain as raw material, but will be more uh, effective and more systematic. Also, uh, what he means by result of living, living dynamic idea. Behind every civilization, there is strong idea, whether it's religious or quasi-religious or re represent of, of reli religions, for example, ideology and others. That's why he formulated his own concept of religious idea, which include religions and ideologies. If we go further, for example, regarding the equation of civilization, Malik bin Nabi, when he went to understand civilization from structural point of view, 
he formulated this formula. Stabilization equal man plus soil plus time. We, he means by man, an insan or the human being, not male, not female. Uh, this formula represents the equation of civilization, which structurally determines its elements or ingredients. These are the basic elements of any uh, civilizational action or product. Soil, our land plus soil plus time, indicates that the problem of civilization can be analyzed into three primary problems. He said, for example, if we want uh, to find those elements, we can take any product of civilization, such as TV, car, book, uh, radio, any product of human uh, manufacturing. If we analyze, for example, the radio or the TV, we find behind the TV man with his own ideas. Then the soil, we mean by the soil, the materials available in this world, then time, which is the period where that we need to achieve such or to reach such product. So in order to resolve uh, our uh, Muslim uh, uh, pro civilizational problems, we need to resolve, to find solutions for the basic elements of civilization, the problem of man or of human being, problem of soil or problems and problems of time, which means we need to resolve issues related to man, his education, his mindset, his morals, and etc. The soil, how to protect soil, how to invest in soil, time, time in its social dimension, dimension, not its physical dimension. Social dimension, which means that time that we spent doing work, for example, from sunshine to sunset, we have, for example, 12 hours. In those 12 hours, in one society, we can uh, pr produce a huge amount of production. In other societies, we may produce nothing. So the social meaning of time here is the quantity of time that, that we spend in work, productive work. For example, we, we, we usually uh, give examples. For example, uh, um, workers in Japan or in USA, within seven hours work, they work six hours and they waste, for example, one hour. Maybe in other countries, within seven hours, they work for one hour and they waste seven hours hours or six hours. So here, the social time in Japan is seven hours out of eight. And social time in Algeria or other places in one hour out of eight hours. This is what he means by time, not the physical, not the metaphysical one. So when we tackle these issues, the three issues, constructing human personality, we have problems with, with personality of, Muslim, of modern Muslim, his mindset, his thinking, his efficiency, etc. How to exploit the soil, how to organize time. If we can resolve these primary basic issues, then we can talk about uh, civilizing a process. The other uh, idea that Malik bin Nabi developed is al fikratu dinia religious idea. He was talking about religious idea, not religion, because religion belongs to Allah. But religious idea is at tadayun, our understanding, our conception, and our implementation of our religious idea. In this, uh, in, the, in this context, so many ideologies can provide what religion provide also. So for Ben Nabi, the religious idea plays the role of catalyst of civilization. It helps the three elements to work together. 
And this one, Malik bin Nabi, relies on history, on anthropology, on uh, uh, different uh, sources to prove that the religious idea was always there in any civilizing a process that humans uh, knew in their history. Quoting him, Malik bin Nabi said, we will find clearly if we study history, we will find clearly that all civilizations have their roots in religious sentiments. For history will tell us that the Buddhist civilization has its roots in Buddhism, the Muslim civilization in Islam, and the Western civilization in Christianity. Even secularism, modern secularism, is the product of Christian faith, because Christian faith in itself separates moral or temporal life from spiritual one. So the very roots of modern secularism is Christian actually. That's why Malik bin Abay sees that religion is pivotal coefficient or catalyst in the equation of civilization. Without religion, the three values of men, soil and time cannot be organized and directed towards their civilizing process. Why? Because religion or the ideology provide, provides the world view, provides values, provides the links, social, familial, individual, provides also what we call al-wa'du al-a'la, some promise in the future, whether here or hereafter. It elevates our, our intention beyond this earth, early, uh, earthly life. So religion is very important. Where, whether this religion in its uh, uh, pure uh, manner or those ideas that replace uh, religion. The other uh, concept uh, is uh, al-insan or man as the primary device of civilization. Although Malik bin Nabi put that formula of civilization equal man plus soil plus time, but without man, soil and time are meaningless because man is the one who has the ability, the power, the faculty to exploit a soil to use time negatively or positively. And as Malik bin Nabi said, uh, uh, man uh, has been created in his natural form by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, naturally, man was created, but human conditions and social surroundings influence him. So your culture, your social conditions will change your situation from raw material, from this natural form to something different based on the ability of man to learn and to do and to, uh, to, to produce. So man is the primary device of civilization. That's why we need in our Muslim situation now to give great intention, great attention, sorry, to, to man, to a human being in terms of his mindset, his culture, his education, how to uh, bring out different um, abilities of man and to put him in positive way to start his uh, civilizing process. The third uh, other concept is culture. For Malik bin Nabi, there is no civilizing process without cultural reform. Why? Because if we refer to the formula man plus soil plus time, if we look into man, man influence or effect uh, um, in this life, works in this life in different manners. 
So Malik, uh, Malik ibn Abi says that man uh, can uh, contribute in society through his uh, thought or through his labor or work or through his wealth. So every member of, of, of the human uh, humanity can contribute in one way or another, whether by his ideas or his workforce or his money. We don't have other dimension. So in order to start civilizing process, we need to uh, give attention to man's thought because even our workforce, our wealth, we can use it based on our ideas. And man's thought means man's culture. If we want to change our mindsets, we need to provide the atmosphere where we can educate, we can uh, uh, bring a new generation uh, different from other generations. So culture is very important. Through culture, we can establish new moral system, new work system, a new worldview, etc. So culture is very important according to Malik bin Nabi. Uh, culture is, is the primary factor that influences man as social personality because we are living in society. We are not living as individuals. We live in communities, in societies. And culture is the focal point in the orientation of human mind and life as well. So culture is the culture, intellectual, social, psychological atmosphere or milieu that include the existence of man in society in which the individual shapes his characteristics and personality. That's why Malik bin Nabi uh, developed these two concepts, taqafatul nahda, taqafatul takhalluf, culture of development and culture of underdevelopment. In order to help our societies to initiate new civilizing process, we need to change human being. How to change human being? We don't change physical form. We change the mindset, the spirits, the personality. And we, how we can change personality? We change personality through culture. And culture is not the folklore as uh, defined by, by some anthropologists. Culture has so many dimensions, value system, uh, a thought, intellectual aspect, epistemological aspect, how to gain knowledge, and practical aspects also. So, for example, Malik bin Abi mentions that Muslims now can talk like what the Quran said, but they don't behave like what the Quran said. It's easy to talk, it's easy to say according to, to the Quran, but it's very difficult to behave, to produce according to or to act according to the Quran teachings. Why? Because our culture, our modern culture, Muslim culture is not in accordance with uh, characteristics of Quranic culture. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha wa alayha salam, when she was asked about uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his, his, his conduct, she said, Kana al -Quran. his behavior, his conduct, not only his sayings. What we lack today is to behave, to act according to Quran. It's easy. All Muslims talk according to Quran, but they don't act according to the Quran. How to change this situation? By changing our culture, our educational system, our family system, our uh, social system, our political systems, all of them should be uh, changed. And those different institutions and systems cannot be changed without changing 
the mindset, the mindsets of Muslims, how Muslims think today. Uh, I think I spent much time. I will stop um, after finishing this colonizability. When Malik bin Nabi uh, spent those three or four decades learning about civilizations, about Muslim societies, uh, Muslim history, he uh, came out with this concept of colonizability, which denotes the internal causes of backwardness and the decline of Muslim civilization. It denotes also that uh, colonization is a result of our ability to be colonized. Malik bin Abi sees that the main cause of Muslim decline is internal cause. Is the main reasons why the Western powers colonized the Muslims, because we reached a stage where we were not able to defend ourselves, to feel that we are free. So the Western power, powers found it easy to dominate our mindsets, our countries, our lands, and everything. So colonization, yes, is very rude behavior and very destructive uh, a project of Western powers, but it's a result of our ability to be colonized. Once we liberate our souls, we liberate ourselves from this psychological situation, once we feel that we are independent in our thought, in our thinking, in our existence, and we should rely on ourselves, then other powers will not colonize us. Colonizability is the ability. It's kind of psychological um, situation or feelings, or as, as Ibn Khaldun conceptualized that, the defeated is always uh, eager to follow uh, the super uh, powers and, and, and other things, if, if my translation is, is right. So for Ben Nabi, uh, the positive step was not to keep insulting uh, Western powers or the devil or asking for our rights. But the positive one is to acknowledge that our internal diseases, our internal causes of the decline, rather than uh, colonization as the cause. Colonization is, is the result of our ability, our psycho uh, mental state of being able to be uh, humiliated, to be colonized, to be dominated by Western thought and Western powers. Uh, one more thing. <laughs> uh, this uh, a table, just to link Malik bin Nabi to some two great figures of philosophy of history, bin, uh, Twainbi and Ibn Khaldun regarding some main ideas of three of them. For example, regarding the, the, the force that motivating civilizing process for Ben Nabi is the religious idea. For Ibn Khaldun is Asabiya plus Anubuwa Awuddin or religion. For Twainbi, religions. Regarding uh, uh, the process of civilization, is it kind of deterministic or not deterministic? For Malik bin Nabi is non-determinist because he sees that uh, in any time, humans can change their minds and reform the situation. And it's not 
uh, necessary that society or civilization going to decline should go through decline. She may come back and uh, go to, to, to kind of rising uh, way. For, for Ibn Khaldun, for Ibn Khaldun, uh, kind of, there is no, no, no chance for society or for state or for civilization which reached stage of decline to revive again, no more. It's the same with, with, uh, with Atwain. Uh, regarding societies, uh, Bennabi divided society in two categories, natural society and historical society. Natural society is kind of a society that does not change its situation throughout history, like the ant society, the bees society, but for a human society is historical because it is changing throughout the course of history. For Ibn Khaldun divided societies into two categories, Bedouins and sedentary. For uh, Twain, the primitive and civilized. Uh, for uh, regarding the causes of decline, for Malik bin Nabi, the main cause of the decline is the breakdown of social relations network, the breakdown of the religious idea from its ideal and the colonizability. For Ibn Khaldun, the causes of decline are luxury, the decline of Asabiya, the absence of the religious restraint or al -wazir. For Atwaybi, uh, the severity of a challenge, the transformation of the creative elite to dominant elite. Once the elite that leads society, its um, thinking changes from uh, leading elite or creative elite to dominant elite, that is a sign uh, that the society in its way of decline. Regarding the stages of civilization or stages of society, Malik bin Nabi divided society into three stages, pre-civilized society, civilized society, and post-civilized society. Ibn Khaldun divided uh, the stages of the state into three stages, the birth, the growth, and the death. For uh, Atwaimbi, Arnold Atwaimbi, divided into four stages, growth, breakdown, disintegration, and uh, decline. This is kind of a brief presentation about Malik bin Nabi's thought, actually, because it's very difficult to summarize uh, all his project into 40 or uh, 50 minutes. Uh, what I want to conclude with is uh, what is important in bin Nabi's thought, because Malik bin Nabi's thought is not a revelation. It's, it's a kind of creative thinking and efforts to establish perspective to resolve a uh, situation of uh, present Muslim situation. So into my mind that the main points which are important in Malik bin Nabi's thought is his approach, his kind of comprehensive approach to understand different aspects of uh, our situation. The second is the model of analysis and study of most Muslim societies' issues. He was not a kind of traditionalist. He is not modernist. He has his own model, which is a civilizational model. Also, he developed so many concepts which can be used to analyze, to understand, and to develop solutions for our today uh, societies. Then uh, the last one is the horizon that uh, Malik bin Nabi opened to Muslim thought instead of a kind of debate between traditionalist and modernist, between Islamist and non-Islamist. He developed a, a kind or he opened a kind of horizon of uh, to work together uh, based on very uh, common uh, points about man, soil, uh, time, uh, diagnost diagnostic approach or pathological approach and those different angles. I hope that they could 
with my broken English uh, to, uh, <laughs> to give uh, some uh, insights uh, about Malik bin Nabi and his thought. However, uh, we cannot say that from this lecture we can understand Malik bin Nabi, but just to raise some issues and to uh, brought the intention of all uh, attendees and participants to read more Malik bin Nabi and to try to approach it and understand his uh, project wa sallallahu wa sallama ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Jazakumullah khairan, Dr. Badran. Uh, just, just a point, your English is fine, so I, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Um, the floor is open for, for, for everyone to ask him questions, inshallah. They can either write to him or ask him directly. Um, if, if I can start, Dr. Badran. Yes, please. <clears throat> um, you, you, I mean, it's, it's obvious Malik bin Nabi is, is, is kind of multi, multi, he has a multi dimensional in terms of understanding society or otherwise. The, the, the point of culture, he talks about Islamic identity as a culture. Mm -hmm. And it's a beginning, it's a starting point of solving the contemporary issue. What culture is he talking about? when Muslims are now mixed with everything. You have basic understanding of Islamic theology, where there is a different type of approach now. You have the modernist, you have the traditionalist, and, and it, it starts from there and then it moves toward the branches of, of understanding Islam. So there is a, a unification of cultural identity among the Muslim uh, space. So when we want to start off, I mean, you, you got to put him in a context because he was within when the French were in Algeria. So he had yeah. an identity. We are Muslim, we are Algerian. So there's a unification, at least among Algerian, of our identity and culture. At the, at the present moment, the Muslim living all over the world, there is an unification. Everyone differs. So, so my question in, in short is, what is it, how, do, how can he apply his idea of beginning from culture? <coughs> culture is not a, a, a one and it's not purely Islamic uh, you know because yes. everyone is affected. that's my first question and and if I can just mention them and then perhaps you can just just explain them um, secondly what does Malik bin Nabi in contemporary world me, means to uh, a young Muslim living in the West who may not have this relation you know there's a gap in, in terms of language and, and again culture and, and, and identity between say a, a, me and, and, and Malik bin Nabi or any other uh, you know people living in the West how can he relate to him? what does Malik bin Nabi means, means to a young man living in the West and the lastly and, and the lastly one what was when you when you talk about characters like Malik bin Nabi and other thinkers what is the relationship with traditional Islam as far as the usul is concerned? Because to bring up, to, to change a society from an Islamic perspective, you have to have some sort of Islam, Islamic, the asal has to be from Islam, if that makes sense. You can't just take a concept that already exists in the other domain and, 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 and change and kind of code, uh, code it with Islamic identity. It doesn't work, the, the usul has to be from. So, what was that Usul Malik was using in order to Islamify the, the, the idea that he was presenting? Barakallahu. Uh, Allah barak uh, Look, uh, regarding culture, the Malik bin Nabi uh, was uh, with the point of view that uh, modern Muslim culture is not culture of that help Muslims to regain their situation because it's it lost its originality. It's kind of mixture of very historical uh, heritage. We should uh, put it under, uh, uh, and, under, under critics. We should criticize our culture and make kind of, um, how to say, tasfiya, <laughs> to purify uh, or to clean uh, our culture from kind from the, the those ideas uh, that we inherit from history 
but they are no more relevant to our modern situation. Although they were right and very efficient in history, but today they are not relevant. We should not bring them to our modern time. We should not live in history. Also, uh, there are some ideas we inherited also from our history, but in their basics, they are not Islamic ideas. They are maybe uh, kind of Asabi and nationalistic or, uh, or they were absorbed by Muslim society from different aspects and mainly they are not uh, Islamic. We should not bring everything from history of Muslim uh, societies and we consider it our culture. Yes, our culture is not the Quran. Our culture is partially from the Quran, partially from our historical development. Then we should clean what is historical and we keep what is original, what transcends history and time. Also, we should look into what we absorbed from modern culture. We absorbed so many things from the West and, and, and the, the East. Is everything coming from the West is bad? No. Is everything coming, is everything modern is good? No. We should put everything under criticism. We should also clean our, uh, what we absorb. How to do that? It's true knowing what's original in our culture. Malik bin Abi see that Islam is the source of our culture. And Islam is not for, for generation that, that passed away. Islam is for all ages. So we should contemplate, we should look into Islam itself, what is original, uh, what is original, and we take it from the Quran and put it as the basic of culture. If we look into the Quran, we see that humans cannot, cannot live without moral system. Humans cannot live without spiritual system. Humans, we ca cannot live without uh, 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 knowledge system or intellectual aspect. Also, humans are the ones who uh, produce uh, uh, civilization. Pro so the practical aspect should be there, or Sina, as Malik bin Ali said, or, uh, which he brought from Ibn Khaldun. Our modern culture, Muslims keep believing in Allah. Muslim never lost his, his, his faith in Allah. But that faith lost its efficiency in real life. There is no difference between who believe in Allah and the one who does not believe in Allah. What, what, what is the difference between Muslim and non-Muslim? If you believe in Allah and the others does not believe, but your faith in Allah does not give you any add value. So the problem whether is in the faith itself or in our culture of gaining efficiency from, from Islam. Of course, the, mis the, the problem is not in the text. The problem is not in Islam because Islam is revealed truth. So the problem is in the Muslim, today Muslim. So we should look into kind of synthesis that bring the originality of Islam into modern, our modern time, but through very educational approach. We should uh, put that culture as uh, a milieu, as atmosphere where we can educate new generation that understand Islam as living truth, but in modern time, not in history. And we live modern time as Muslims, not as something else. So the culture, once we change, for example, for example, there are so many uh, mythical elements in our Muslim culture today. But if we look into the Quran, Quran indicates us that we should base uh, on truth and scrutiny, we should, should use uh, uh, our reasons 
we should be more rational. But Muslims are not rational. Most of them very traditional. What we mean by traditional, those who kind of imitation. I don't mean traditionalist means the old schools and madahib. No, I don't mean that. I mean uh, Muslims now, they, they, they are in contradiction. They are in contradiction with the spirit of the Quran itself. The first verse revealed to Muhammad is Iqra, but Muslims are the least communities in reading in the world. So we don't build our uh, attitudes, our families, our <laughs> work on knowledge, whether is it uh, the spiritual knowledge or uh, the, the, the empirical one. So in order to, to have new culture, we should put those points into consideration in order to form uh, a situation or milieu where our kids, our new generations, became more efficient. Not only they know Allah, but they love Allah also. They live in accordance with, with Allah's teachings. Now, in modern time, uh, we, we read, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ But we are not a izza. We are very humiliated people. Because of because of what? Because we don't transform um, those teachings in the Quran and Sunnah into our educational system, our family system, our political system. So the culture, we mean that we need to provide uh, a room for a new mindset, new spirit, new personality. This is, uh, as I understand, from Malik Nabi uh, by talking about culture. And culture, he, he, he call it uh, the constitution of culture. What he means by constitution of culture, he means that culture has very important dimensions. If we lost one dimension, our culture will be, will be in chaos. The spiritual dimension, the moral dimension, the knowledge dimension, the intellectual dimension and the practical dimension, and also the aesthetic dimension. For example, if we read Hadith, hadith Jibreel, Al Iman wal Islam wal Ihsan, Al Ihsan is the highest level uh, that you, you, you are in very, I mean, in accordance with all teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it means that you reach the culmination of beauty, but in reality, uh, Muslims are not. If we look to our um, cities, our, uh, I mean, uh, gardens, we don't find that beauty that should, should be there. So uh, once uh, we can, once we, we realize those dimensions of culture, which are derived from Islamic teachings, for our modern time, then we can uh, think about starting a uh, civilizing process. Your second question, I forgot it. <laughs> uh, um, due to time, uh, Sheikh, uh, my apology, um, we went uh, really, really beyond. Um, my, my second, I mean, you kind of put all the questions together in terms of my second question was, how does uh, Bin Nabi, Nabi justify his Islamization, that he uses usul from the principle. But Alhamdulillah, you cannot cover a lot of it. Uh, just due to time, uh, I mean, this is a fascinating uh, discussion. And uh, Malik bin Nabil is a is fairly new character within the Western discourse. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, he's not, he's not well studied in the English language and, 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 and within the Western uh, academia. Uh, so it's, it's a starting, and your lecture will certainly uh, excite those who are interested in, in Malik bin Nabil and, and, and Nabi and his, his, his understanding. So on that note, uh, I would like to end this program. I mean, let me say one word about uh, Muslim generations in the West. How can they benefit from Malik bin Nabi? Malik bin Nabi is not apologetic thinker; he's very systematic thinker. 
he said that we should not look into the West uh, in black and way, white, uh, I mean, but in the West, we can find many, many colors. We should approach the West critically, not to defend or not to apologize or not to imitate, but to learn this very uh, huge uh, civilizational experience which dominates the world now. We cannot ignore it, we cannot uh, fight it, but we need to learn from it. And uh, we should be a student who can learn and take the best and leave what is not in accordance with our worldview, then we can uh, uh, establish our new initiative. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. I'm surely, I'm sure this program will be a, a beginning to something great in terms of understanding uh, Malik bin Nabi. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward him and to raise his rank in Jannah for, for trying to take the Muslim from a situation of weakness in terms of thought to that which which we had once in terms of greatness. Um, so we, I, I personally thank you and on behalf of ILS, Jazakumullah once again. Wassalamu alaikum. Inshallah. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. ليس اليتيم الذي قد مات والده إن اليتيم يتيم العلم والأدب